So, <laughs> can you see, see me? Um, <laughs> could I have a stool, perhaps? <laughs> Speaking of the academy being made for men, <laughs> um, <laughs> In the late 1990s, Lean O'Neill gave an address at the Eastern Division meeting, I'm actually standing on my toes, of the American Philosophical Association on the ra rather innovative topic of publication of 17th and 18th century women philosophers. She highlighted the work about, of about 60 early modern women. Uh, I don't imagine, I'm not, I haven't seen this talk, so I don't know how you cover and highlight the work of 60 people in one talk, but she did it. Um, yeah, about 60 early modern women in an attempt to communicate to a public of professional philosophers the impressive quantity and scope of women's contributions within that period of the history of thought. She also emphasized evidence for the recognition awarded them by their generally male contemporaries, including the inclusion of their work in academic journals and the publication of numerous editions and translations of their writing up into the 19th century. So why did she do this? That's the quote I have up here. Why I have presented this somewhat interesting but nonetheless exhausting overview of 17th and 18th century women philosophers, quite simply to overwhelm you with the presence of women in early modern philosophy. It is only in the way, it is only in this way that the problem of women's virtually complete absence in contemporary history of philosophy becomes pressing, mind-boggling, possibly scandalous. So all this was to emphasize the puzzling nature of their neglect in our contemporary historical narrative of the history of thought. Perhaps puzzling, of course, is the wrong word. Probably all of us could generate some speculative reasons that have some truth to them about why this is the case, right? And we've heard some reasons as well about why this might be the case. So one of my primary purposes today is similar to O'Neill's was, I wish to impress upon this audience that the evidence of significant philosophical contributions of women from this period is overwhelming and their absence in our contemporary treatments of the history of philosophy is something of a scandal. I will then offer a sense of the challenges facing the discipline in trying to integrate these thinkers into our current historical narrative. Um, and this is building on some work of some others. I'll suggest some ways that we might fruitfully make space for these women in our treatment of early modern philosophy, um, scholarship and teaching, because it seems like they're tied. If they're not in the teaching, um, they're not ultimately going to be in the new scholarship. So it needs to happen in both places. And to give the audience a sense of what we are missing out on when we overlook these thinkers, I'll finish by taking a quick look at three of the pioneering women from the early modern period, Elizabeth of Bohemia, Mary Astell, and Margaret Cavendish. Um, so let me first give you a little bit of information about women of early modern philosophy. And excuse me, I wrote a paper that was too long, and I am editing as I go. <laughs> um, so there were many, many women who were writing and publishing. Um, but it was not typically, typically the case that these women had had much for formal education. So Elizabeth of Bohemia is, is one uh, exception, and she's, of course, one of the earliest women we're kind of including in this group. Um, she benefited from an earlier custom of educating women in the home, but most were self-educated. Philosophical discussions of the day assumed knowledge of Latin as well as either English or French, which, of course, limited who managed to enter the discussion um, and what kind of views they were able to present and in what form they presented them. Um, many of the women who've managed to publish had some claim to nobility or to royalty, which, of course, is not surprising. Um, and perhaps also not surprising, most were either childless or only had one child. Um, it's generally taken that if you were raising a large family, it would have been very difficult. <laughs> Maybe some people in this room know about this. <laughs> if you're raising children, it can be really difficult to be an academic. <laughs> um, however, there were some really interesting cultural trends that were actually conducive to these women, or to women doing writing. Um, one was the growing tendency to publish in the vernacular. Um, it was also not typically required at the time that a writer have a particular office or, you know, academic credentials or qualifications to enter into a philosophical debate. And interestingly, gender itself did not pre prevent, or present the barrier that we might expect. Um, both acceptability of women's discussions of matters of the soul, so primarily theological issues, and often these figured into the debates of the day, and the Cartesian view of natural reason as essential to human minds, male and female, made room for women's voices in scholarly debate. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, Descartes and Cartesianism later. 
So though a few men, women managed to publish the type, or sorry, though few women managed to publish the type of manuscript we now identify as books, many women published in the form of short pamphlets, which were appealing to booksellers as quick and easy ways to make money on current discussions and controversies. There was also a large amount of philosophical debate playing out in the form of correspondence, many of which were published in time. So letters were a semi-public form of debate that allowed for an easy and socially acceptable mode of introduction of women philosophers to their famous and more known male contemporaries. Uh, indeed, the women who wrote typically had the explicit support of the men in their lives, husbands, brothers, fathers, and the willingness of male contemporaries to engage their views. Their publications were circulated, reprinted, their ideas were taken seriously both in their lifetimes and in the general philosophical discussions of the early modern period. As Margaret Atherton observed, if their views have been forgotten, it cannot be attributed directly to any bias against women existing at the time they wrote. So, we may reasonably ask, okay, so why were their views forgotten then? Um, well, there are, of course, many, many reasons, and some have been nicely captured in the scholarship, um, and here's just a few of the ones that I found particularly compelling. Uh, one interesting thing is the phenomena that um, Eileen O'Neill has identified as the purification of philosophy. So she points out that much of the work done by early modern women featured prominently issues either related to faith and revelation or gender and the role of women. Uh, given what was mentioned above about the acceptability of women's voices entering discussions on these issues, it shouldn't be surprising that this is often, often what they were writing about. The problem is that by the late 18th century, philosophy as a discipline was well into a strong trend towards secularization. The purification of philosophy meant the excising of religious approaches. There was also a tendency to see work on gender and the woman question as a, quote, pre-critical issue of purely anthropological interest. <laughs> Thus, with the redefining of the discipline, much women's work was suddenly considered non-philosophical. Uh, another change that I think is significant and worth noting, um, it's probably one that people in this room could predict, is changes in the social and political climate, um, in particular has been identified as the aftermath of the French Revolution. So, um, here's the quote from O'Neill again. At the very commencement of modern democracy, culture's anxiety was focused on whether women's limited entrance into the newly democratized public sphere would lead to women's equal participation in economic and political power. In this period, the woman author came to epitomize all women's increasing autonomy and the possibility of their economic independence. But it was the female theoretical authors, especially philosophers, who received a particularly nasty reception in the early 19th century. For to be a philosopher in this period was to be a shaper of culture. But what if philosopher queens could rule the polis? Such a dismantling of male hegemony at the birth of modern democracy was more more than most of democracy's staunchest supporters could manage. <laughs> um, so both of these explanations suggest forces that led to the forgetting of the influence of early modern philosophers that we might quickly identify as being unjust reasons for them no longer being included in the philosophical canon. Um, and we might say, well, that's clearly inappropriate. The solution might be easy. The removal was unjust. Um, and the canon and accompanying narrative should be revised accordingly. We just need to put them back in there. However, there's some actually really tricky issues in reintegrating these voices into the narrative of the history of thought, and I think it deserves some attention here. Um, so O'Neill has made a compelling case that it is clear early modern women philosophers made contributions to the key questions and debates of their time. There are good records of their exchanges with male contemporaries and reference to their work. Still, quote, those engaged in historical reconstruction take the significant issues, strategies, and texts to be the ones deemed so by the philosophers of the past, we can conclude that if our current historical reconstructions of that period fail to include published works or writings by women that were circulated in scholarly circles and acknowledged in their own time as philosophically useful, our histories are incomplete and distorted. However, rewriting the canon is not a straightforward process and it comes with a host of challenges. To merely allow a current interest to dictate sort of shoehorning some female philosophers into our received historical narrative of philosophical thought will not result in the kind of long-term remembering of these forgotten voices that we're aiming for. So this is at least part of what Lisa Shapiro has argued about the project of rewriting the history of philosophy to include women. 
Uh, I think consideration a few of the concerns she raises about the methodology of incorporating these thinkers into our collective history is valuable here. She considers a few possible approaches. First, she says, we may opt to weave the writings of these women into pre-existing historical narratives of thought. Um, this seems a real possibility, given the evidence we have that these women did engage so directly and fruitfully with many of the, can the canonical thinkers and philosophies that already make up our standard narrative. But this approach does not entirely answer our concern in that the women philosophers of the early modern period who are currently marginalized are in this respect on equal footing with male less known philosophers. The motivation to include the former, not the latter, could be argued to be not yet internal to philosophy as a discipline, but rather a response to a kind of external feminist interest. So the idea being that if we have a bunch of thinkers who've all contributed but are lesser known and we only pick the women, it's not appropriately motivated by interest in the philosophical topics. It has just to do with them being women and this maybe isn't a long-term solution to the problem. Um, and now I lost my spot because I looked at you guys. <laughs> well, this is not bad. So while the shoehorning of women she's not claiming is a bad thing, I think in the short term she thinks it's quite a good thing, um, she suggests it isn't a recipe for long-term incorporation of these women. Uh, quote, the characters of these women, or better, of their writings, are just not well developed, and so we are left wondering what they are doing in the picture. Uh, that metaphor really struck a chord with me because the philosophy student club this week, the, the discussion they're holding has to do with women's portrayal in movies and in media, and they were pulling up all these stats. So this idea that we still do this now with our stories, right? You have a story, it's really about men, but they say, oh, we've got to, you know, try and get a woman in there, and yet it's quite apparent the plot and a lot of key aspects could go on without her. And we don't want that to be the case with the historical narrative of philosophy, right? Don't want them to be secondary characters. So how do we generate these good internal philosophical reasons for treating women philosophers? Um, the approach above where we just try and weave them into the main questions is conservative in that it suggests adding women to the current narrative without actually changing anything about the narrative. Women's voices are tagged on without shaping the overall set of questions, concerns, and the direction of the story. It's the same story and we keep the same central characters. They become secondary. Um, yeah, in our attempts to include women in what we teach, we want to avoid making them look like a band of secondary or supporting characters. <laughs> um, so Shapiro ultimately suggests that generating good internal philosophical reasons for inclusion of women in our standard narratives of the history of thought needs to involve broadening the questions we take to be central in framing our philosophical narratives. And she identifies two questions in particular that look like promising additions. Um, I like them and want to add a third. Um, First, the philosophical treatment of the question of what it is to be a woman. She points out that even within feminist studies, there hasn't been a lot of work done on tracing the concept, the kind of conceptual philosophical history of what it is to be a woman through the history of philosophy. Um, and I, I think she is talking specifically about what philosophers are doing, because I think this is being done in other disciplines. But, um, but I think it's true. The conceptual history within the context of philosophical studies, there isn't as much of this as there could be. So that's one of the questions she suggests we introduce as being actually a central part of how we um, you know, shape our narrative. Um, the second question, she says, is that we should be looking at the history of thought um, of questions about proper education, because this was another topic that was treated by many women writers, and it's not difficult to imagine why treatment of this topic will lend itself well to connections with a lot of the more standard concerns of er the early modern period, in particular concerns about epistemology and philosophy of mind. Those things are going to play into each other very well and give us um, good philosophical reasons to be inviting some of these women's writing into how we're treating and shaping this narrative. But now let me step away from the discussion of the reasons and some of the potential solutions for the forgotten work of early modern philosophers. Um, with that basic sense of where the discipline, where these studies are at in mind, I just wanted to get, help you get to know a couple of these women. So my intention is ultimately not to induce not only to introduce, but also to suggest how the figures I look at might work into the kind of reimagined narrative being suggested here. So now we actually can change the slide, because the whole reason I have slides is I wanted pictures. <laughs> I didn't have pictures before. So first we have Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia, who has a fantastic hat. Um, 
and uh, yeah, <laughs> she was born in 1618. Um, her parents were briefly king and queen of Bohemia, and then they were exiled to Holland, which turned out to be a good thing for her because in the Hague there, there was a huge meeting of minds on a regular basis, and that's where she had a chance to meet Rene Descartes. Um, when she met Rene Descartes, she was really taken by his philosophy, um, and apparently too shy when she first met him and engaged him to actually bring up her concerns. So later wrote a letter saying, basically, this dualism you're pr proposing, I find really interesting, but I don't understand how mind and body are supposed to interact. Um, and that started a really fruitful correspondence where Descartes tried to answer her questions and I think with time came to understand that she was bringing up a, a pretty significant philosophical issue with his, um, with his system. So in Elizabeth we have um, oh, she wrote him after, and then eventually this correspondence played a big role in shaping how Descartes went on to develop his thought. Um, interestingly, part of how he went on to develop his thought was writing a book on the passions, which seemed to be this kind of phenomena that connects mind and body. But a lot of the time in, in how we treat Descartes, we don't look at his theory of the passions. <laughs> um, I work on theories of the passion, so I have to throw that in. <laughs> so it looks like if we were to look at Descartes' thought as it developed, his answer to this question of mind-body mind dualism as it develops, one, um, we would get to treat the passions, which is what I'd like to do, and two, we would feel very good internal philosophical reasons for including what Elizabeth writes. Right? Um, so, Elizabeth's work has the advantage of having very good internal philosophical reasons for inclusion. Much of her exchange with Descartes centered on a kind of response to the problem of mind-body interaction that continues to resonate with us today. Um, I have in my paper a word about Descartes because I know he gets a bad rap in contemporary crowds, particularly from those um, of a feminist bent. Contemporary critics include, of course, or contemporary critiques include the worry about his substance dualism and the interaction problem, but also maybe more particularly worries about uh, the way that it appears he privileges mind and things that we have tended historically to associate with the masculine over the sensitive and the embodied, which have historically been associated with the feminine. And so there's been a suggestion that Cartesian um, philosophy has actually played a role in continuing to suppress women's voices. I don't want to contest that there has been that role played, but I do want to point out that Descartes actually at his time was providing an, an opening for women to have voices in philosophical discussion. The reason being that Descartes' separation of mind and body invited those who had traditionally been told they were not to join the conversation because of their embodied state to conceive of themselves as a thinking thing distinct from their embodied state. So arguably, women of Descartes' time read Descartes and said, I can think, I can go through the meditation, I can, I think therefore I am, right? Um, and therefore, I can engage philosophically. And it looks like their voices maybe were accepted partly on this growing understanding about rational human nature. Um, so Mary Astell, we can switch. I hope I matched up with all the points that were up there. I don't remember because <laughs> I'm editing here. I forgot there was stuff up there. Mary Astell is a good example of someone who I think um, really took off on this kind of Cartesian theme, this idea that we can be thinkers on our own. So the quote we have here is, all have not leisure to learn languages and pore on books, nor opportunity to converse with the learned, but all may think, may use their own faculties rightly and consult the matter. Matter? Yeah, I bet that's a typo and I'm not sure what it is, which was within them. <laughs> Sorry. So she was among women who found Cartesian dualism the confirmation that women, like men, are by nature rational creatures and thinking things. She was a woman of a surprisingly modest background with no formal education, but ultimately she argued that any intellectual shortcomings that women were thought to exhibit were not a result of nature, but rather of a lack of education. She both urged the self-education of women as well as the establishment of institutions for their education. She argues, oh, I liked this quote, a rational mind is too noble a being to be made for the sake and service of any creature. The service a woman at any time becomes obliged to pay to a man is only a business by the by, just as it may be any man's business and duty to keep hogs. <laughs> um, so less entertaining, but perhaps more to the point is this quote, the one that I had above, and it also has a typo here. 
so I'm not sure what that word was. <laughs> Books and education are not necessary to a clear and effective thinking. This is a Cartesian principle of work, at work. So in Astel, what I want to suggest is with Elizabeth, we had an example of how she can be justified and woven into the philosophical narrative as it exists. I think with Astel, we begin to feel motivation for introducing some of these other key questions, the role of women, um, the nature, and the proper pursuit of education. These are things that can be tied very directly to the epistemological concerns of the day, um, to the theory of human nature and theory of mind of the day. And by including those questions and how we shape the narrative, we suddenly see that it's actually of necessity that we would be including some of these writers. So before leaving you today, I want to mention one more woman whose philosophical contributions were vast, varied, and well-respected in her time. But I'm actually not going to talk about them because I want to talk about her style. <laughs> um, we're going to talk about Margaret Cavendish. She wrote a considerable amount in a huge number of forms. Um, so the other two writers I mentioned in order to get a sense of how these thinkers could be incorporated into our historical philosophical narrative, I actually decided I want to use Cavendish as an example of a pioneer, since that's our theme here. The women I've spoken of today were certainly pioneers in their times. Women continue to be pioneers in philosophy, as we've heard, a discipline that continues to be male-dominated. And I've been recommending a particular kind of pioneering here, that is the expanding and rewriting, reshaping of the philosophical canon and the story we tell of the history of thought. So Cavendish was, an except, was exceptional as a pioneer, and I wonder if we can't take pointers from her. So she wrote, she was famous for plays, letters, orations, poetry, fiction. She's sometimes credited as having written the first sci-fi book, um, as well as her efforts in natural philosophy and her active engagement in current scientific thought. So she's not afraid of interdisciplinary work, is what I take away from that. Um, she was a prolific writer who published under her own name, proudly, in fact, <laughs> this right here is, is a frontispiece of her book. It is her as a grand philosopheress, right? And um, surrounded by Greek goddesses who will kind of give her this authority. I mean, this was shameless, really. She was putting herself right out there. One of the other ways she put herself out there, I told you most women were writing in the form of pamphlets. But because she had money and means, she was like, forget that. I'm going to write a big book that you want to keep in your library. And that's what she did. <laughs> she financed herself to write in a form that would get her taken seriously. Right? So how about there, not afraid of self-promotion. I think that is absolutely true. She wasn't afraid to use the resources she had to assert her presence. <laughs> um, and she used her high social status and financial security to get herself published and acknowledged. She made her way into social groups with the best minds of the day. She knew the men and those thinkers. She was actually invited to various events and was one of the first women to, to see certain scientific discussions and presentations. Um, and I think it's all because she had a boldness and she had a passion. And to my sense, she had a life energy um, that fit into all this. So extravagant and eccentric mad mage stands alone as one of the few early modern women who was bold enough to stake out her philosophical position in a non-anonymous way, even at the risk of public ridicule. Um, and I assume my time must be pretty close to up, is it? Is anyone? Two minutes, perfect, okay. So that gives me enough time to actually talk about kind of some of the conclusions, which I think is another slide. No picture, sorry. So um, actually, probably go faster if I just work from here. <laughs> some concluding thoughts. So what do I want you to take away from this? Hopefully some excitement about the amount of literature there is out there you could be checking out coming from early modern women. Um, I want to suggest that the reworking of the narrative of the history of thought um, needs to be done in such a way that women's voices are included as key players is part of our current philosophical pioneering. Um, Insisting on the inclusion of philosophical discussion of education and womanhood in our treatments of epistemology and philosophy of mind and human nature seem to me to be key moves in creating space for the inclusion of women for good internal reasons. So um, solving some of these problems we have with figuring out how to get women into the current canon. Um, and then I just want to mention kind of my own goal here. Um, perhaps follows Elizabeth's lead, in particular 
would be a goal to look deeper into what Elizabeth had to say. Insofar as Elizabeth was the motivation for Descartes to write on the passions and develop his theory of the passions, um, I think that pushing for the inclusion of questions about the treatment of emotion as part of the standard approach to philosophy in both our history of thought and in contemporary treatments, there's a lot of typos in this slide, <laughs> sorry. Um, I think that that will do two things. One, it will answer a need I think we do have to include our emotional natures more fully in our treatments of epistemology, metaphysics, um, reasoning, and certainly ethics and practical matters. Uh, but also, I have a good sense, a lot of these women wrote on the passions. It wasn't just Elizabeth. A lot of them ended up writing on the passions and trying to understand how the passions interact with the epistemologies and the metaphysics of their day. Um, and I think that if we ask these questions about the passions, we will naturally find, again, that we're turning to women writers more frequently. Thank you.